the great honor of working with this spectacular collection. And uh, I'll give you a little background on it. It is composed of primarily maps, map from primarily four sources. Uh, one, maps that were acquired by the library. The library burned in 1925 that everything was lost in the fire. So we had, we had maps that were acquired primarily by, by the Southern History Department or by the Science and Technology Department as a part of government reports. And then Mr. H. E. gives his collection, and it is the largest segment uh, of the collection. And as I go through the maps tonight, I'm not going to tell you where each of them came from because I didn't write each one of them down. But I will give you uh, an example from three of our major donor collections. Mr. A.G. also encouraged Mr. Woodward, who was president of Woodward Iron, to give his private collection. And their collections differ just a little bit. Well, actually, they differ a lot. Mr. A.G.'s collection started at the beginning of cartography and focused in on the land that became Alabama. Mr. Woodward's collection, he was interested primarily in Native Americans and in Alabama itself. And then Dr. Charles Oakes came along in the 1980s, 90s I guess. And Dr. Oakes had been a career naval uh, officer, a doctor in the Navy, and had traveled all over the world, and he, as he traveled, he collected maps. So he has a lot of maps on travel, and he has a particularly large collection of maps on the Caribbean area, which of course includes uh, the southeastern states uh, coastline. So those three collections come together to give us a really good picture of where we are today. Uh, the collection continues to find that buy things, acquire things as they become available. But the materials that have been given to us uh, are pretty much beyond acquisition for most libraries at this point. We have been involved in a project for about eight years to publicly catalog the maps and to make them publicly accessible. And that's the trick. Uh, we, as we catalog our maps, we have each one digitized. The uh, cartographic lab at the University of Alabama does that digitization for us. And so everyone, every map that's in our catalog, you can also go to that, that same site, you'll see view online image. And you can search that map, and you can magnify the map, and you can get also just about get exactly the same information as if you were actually looking at the map. We are one of the very, very few libraries in the world that's chosen to do that. And this is a world-class collection. We put all of our cataloging and holdings into what is called WorldCat, which is the international uh, bibliography of library holdings. Every major library in the world uses it. And we will often find things that this is the only place a researcher would find. And that doesn't mean that we're the only library that holds it. Well, we're the only one, if they're looking for it, this is Birmingham, and it's the only place they can find it. And anything that they find on our catalog, with very few exceptions, something that was too big or something like that, will also have a digital image of it. So that's, that's our little project. We are uh, delighted tonight to give you a little uh, short introduction to Spain as it came to the New World, as seen through the maps, some of the maps that we have. And this is a very small portion of the collection, and it's specialized just to look at Spain. Uh, not <coughs> Spain itself, but what Spain did in the New World. Many of these maps, most of these maps, are French uh, or English. Uh, 
Spanish maps themselves are much rarer. Uh, and the other two great map makers in Amsterdam was the other major map center. Made a, a careful habit of copying everything they could get a hold of. So what we'll see tonight is largely what Spain was doing as reported on maps drawn by, by other nations. Now in spite of everything we've been told from elementary school on, these people did not think the world was flat. Now if you live back in the middle of the prairie somewhere, uh, you might think, yes, the world is flat. Most people probably never gave it a thought. But if you live near the coast, or if you were a sailor or worked anything around ships, you knew the world was round. People had discovered that a long time ago. Every time there's a lunar eclipse and the earth comes between the sun and the moon and you see the shadow of the earth cast on the moon, it's clear that it's an arch, an arc. Uh, observers knew that everything they had seen in the heavens for which they could determine the shape was, in fact, round. So, when we say that they were going off into uncharted territory, that's an entirely different thing than saying that they thought the world was flat. Now, we have been building things tall for a long, long time. This is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This is the, the lighthouse at Rhodes, Alexandria, Egypt. It was 400 feet high and for many centuries was the tallest man-made structure on earth. Now there's only one reason to make something high, and that is to either see over or to be seen over the curvature of the earth. Now, if you have a light and you put it on, on the, uh, the beach and have it on a six-foot pole, you can see that about three miles out to sea. If you put it on top of a 400-foot stand, like this lighthouse, you can see it for over 26 miles. If you put the watchman on the top of a 50-foot ship mast, you can then see the light for 35 miles. So they realized very quickly the advantage of being able to navigate using these uh, materials that were placed either burning or just simply shining. This is the Tower of Hercules. This is built by the Romans on the northwest coast of Spain, uh, about 2nd century AD. It's been in constant use ever since then. It is the oldest operating lighthouse in the world, still operating this day, obviously. Now let's go back to the circle. Columbus was an Italian sailing in the service of Spain. Uh, he was a sea captain, and a sea captain was not something you just decided to apply for. Uh, you had a to have a lot of qualifications to be a sea captain. You had to have a knowledge of celestial cell, uh, uh, structures, where the stars were and the directions they pointed. You had to have a knowledge of weather and how to forecast weather. You had to have a knowledge of ships and how to sail. You had to have a knowledge of uh, men in order to hire a crew. You had to manage that crew. You had to decide how long it was going to take to get where you were going and buy enough food and stock enough water and everything that anyone would need while they were gone. So being a ship captain was a very responsible organization. Now Columbus had uh, been a captain for a while and he came up with an idea. Now this time, let's pretend we're looking at the Earth. And this is the South Pole. So everywhere we look, we're obviously looking north. But let's say that Spain is up here. Now it had been known for a long, long time that over here somewhere, 
there were riches in spices, silks, pharmaceuticals, and a lot of other things that were requested in Europe. The problem was the trip overland from here to there was long and dangerous and very expensive. So that these products, by the time they got to Spain or wherever they were going, were exorbitantly expensive. Well, Columbus said, if I could walk to the east and get there, and I know that the earth is round, why can't I simply sail around it and come to the same place? So he took his idea to the folks for whom he was employed, that is the Spanish crown. Now Spain was uh, a mixture of a lot of things. This is the 1574 map by Rosselli uh, of Spain. Spain had only recently, when Columbus set in to ask for the favor, become something like a nation. It had been a group of warring families that fought each other. The only thing they had in common with each other is their hatred of the Muslim invaders. So they had joined together to fight the Muslims. But the state was pretty well brought together as a nation by the intermarrying of two of the most powerful families. And that's an old tradition in Europe. Uh, we can't quit fighting, so we'll just marry each other and then we'll have to get along. King Ferdinand of Argonne and Queen Isabella of Castile married and basically formed the Spanish nation. Now, in 1492, the last Muslim army was defeated at uh, Granada. So in 1492, that probably was much more important than the fact that you had a captain saying he thought he knew how to sail out to sea and wind up over there where they bought all these goodies. So he came looking for financing. And you remember the story of how it was financed. Mm -hmm. She sold the jewels. Uh -huh. She hopped her jewels. She hopped her jewels. That's right. She hopped her jewels. This is a man and wife in marriage, but it's two very competitive families. The Castiles now own whatever comes out of this venture. Thank you, Sam. That was good. <coughs> now, there are all sorts of theories on why Virgil, God and Gold, with a couple of books that have that title. Columbus wrote, No one should fear to undertake any task in the name of our Savior if it is just and if the intention is purely for his holy service. In that same diary, he mentioned God 26 times and he mentioned gold 114 times. <laughs> Columbus would make four trips, 1492, 1493, 1498, and in 1500. He would die thinking he had still reached still thinking that he had reached the Orient. He had just reached a part of it that nobody had seen before. Uh, he did not die impoverished, as one of the theories has said, but he didn't get the glory that he wanted. This is a 1540, I mean a 1528 map by uh, Benedetto Bordone. This is from the Oaks Collection. This is done less than 30 years after Columbus's last voyage. You see, there's a lot that was already known. They had, they had already pretty thoroughly explored the western shore of, of Africa, and so it is well defined. Uh, this is, the scale doesn't show it, but the Mediterranean was thoroughly surveyed. Uh, the Romans had sailed it for years. Matter of fact, they called it Mar Nostra, our sea. Belong to them. They had lighthouses all around it. They do all points of interest and so on. But you see, even at this early time, they know there's a place called India. They know there's an Indian Ocean, except they're calling it the, the Indian Sea. They know there's an Asia 
major, which means there must be an Asia Minor. They know there's a Labrador. Uh, so there's a lot known. This is, uh, this is a, these are the actual maps. These are not copies. This is actually done in 1528. This is a woodcut, as is the next one. Uh, all the others will be engraved uh, on copper plates. This map was drawn for this program. This is the New World by Sebastian Munster from 1545. Cartography families, or cartographers tend to run in families. Uh, a cartographer, cartographic firm, will stay in business for generations. The son learning from the father and so on. The, uh, the Munsters stayed in business an awful long time. This is an AG map, uh, and it is, like I said, it is a, just a jewel. This is, uh, now you'll have to bear with me because I have to figure out all the magnifications and all. Do you see this map? As if I change the magnification just a little bit. Spain over here and the Spanish flag over here. Now what more could you want? <laughs> we also have the Portuguese flag out here, which we'll just talk about in just a second. Uh, we see Florida. We see uh, what is now Cape Breton. Uh, we see South America. And we see something that we'll see on a lot of maps, particularly Spanish maps. If they don't want you to go there, they will tell you that there are cannibals there, <laughs> or there are flesh-eating insects, or just all sorts of matters, if they don't want you to go to this particular location. So this is done in 1545 uh, by Munster. Now, as soon as Columbus got back, they didn't know exactly what they had found, what he had found, but they knew it was important. They knew it was potentially very profitable. And so Ferdinand and Isabella, being good Catholics, petitioned the Pope, who happened to be Spanish to designate all of the New World for Spain. So they approached the Pope and he was agreeable to that. Uh, but uh, Portugal was also a good Catholic nation. And they said, hold on, your holiness. Let's look at this a little farther. Uh, Portugal already had large settlements on the West African coast. They had, by this time, this is just two years later, they had made settlement on the west coast, east coast of South America. So they said, hold on. So they finally reached a treaty, the Treaty of Tordesillas, I guess, that's close, in 1494, by which the Pope agreed to divide the world, as if it was the Pope to divide, but the Pope divided, divided the world on um, <coughs> what is now, well actually it's about 1,100 miles west of Cape Verde, which is, was the Portuguese settlement right in here. And it's about halfway between there and where Columbus settled. And so the line runs down through here. Now nobody except the Spanish and the Portuguese ever paid any attention to it. The French and the, Spanish and the English and the Dutch and all, they didn't pay attention to it anyway. But the Spanish and the uh, Portuguese took it seriously. Uh, and the, the Pope's order further said, if there's a European power there, they are to be left alone. So you'll see, we see dots of French and Dutch and even English in the Caribbean, but there are exceptions. Most of it is either Spanish or Portuguese. Now, people who bumped up on their Spanish before they went to the Olympics were in for surprise because Brazil does not speak Spanish. It speaks Portuguese. Because the Pope's order also said that if the European power has a settlement, which in this case was having awaited the shore on the shore of what would become Brazil, Portugal 
proceeded to build the, what becomes the largest nation in South America, that being Brazil, and it speaks uh, Portuguese, and virtually everybody else in the area speaks Spanish. This is the uh, map by uh, Abraham Ortelius, and this is another great map family. This is done in 1571, and I think it's on the wall, but I want to, it's large, and so it's hard to see detail, but I want to show you a few things. This is 1571. You see Canaveral is already there. Cusa is already there. So you understand that when the federal government decided to change the name of Cape Canaveral to Cape Kennedy, these people were upset, not because they had anything against President Kennedy, but Canaveral was a very old name that they wanted to keep. But look at the, uh, look at the detail, towns, churches. Mapping in this period is absolutely amazing when you look back and see really how close they got a lot of things, given the fact they had no modern instruments of any kind. <clears throat> this is a map of the Gulf of Mexico by Belin in 1754. And you're already seeing the development of the Spanish area, but I want to show you just a couple of things. You see the route of Ponce de Leon, who settled, who, who discovered Florida, looking for the Fountain of Youth. You see already, there's Cape Canaveral again, there's St. Augustine. You see the entrance to Mobile and Dolphin Island already. So these names have been here a long time, Pensacola, uh, the Mobile River. It also shows the route of Cortez, Hernando uh, Cortez. Um, Cortez is uh, the man who really brings home the bacon, so to speak. He's the, uh, the conqueror of the New World. He is responsible for most of the bad publicity that Spain has out of the colonial period. He, he didn't have a lot of firepower as far as munitions, but he had something the natives had never seen. That was a horse. A man in armor on top of a horse that you've never seen must have been a very imposing warrior. He wipes out within about four years the Inca Empire, which had been in existence for thousands of years. Uh, most of the Native Americans died not from war, but from disease, uh, struck down by disease, European diseases for which they had no natural immunity. And we'll talk about the, the tradition and so on a little bit later. This is a, a dark map, and I want to show it to you for one reason. This is uh, by Ortiz. This is 1579. And again, I want to show you the, the detail that they go through. Uh, they don't just say, you know, there's a river here. There's a town there. But there are towns, there are churches, there are roads. Not on this particular one, but on a lot of them. Uh, you're beginning to see what is called relief. They show you how the surface looks. They're beginning to give you pictures and so on. And where they don't know anything about what's on actually there, they will often put a large ship or ships or a sea monster or a large cartouche, as they've done here, which includes the name of the map and the date of the map. And some of the uh, some of the cartouche may be an absolute work of art. It may look like they spent more time with the cartouche than they did on the map. Uh, and I think this 
particular map has two, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. They're big on angels and uh, winged children and so on like that. Pooty. This is a very famous map. There are three maps on a single page. Uh, usually when you find it for sale today, it has been cut and they're sold as individual maps. And of course, the most sought after in our part of the world is this one. This is done by Geronimo Chavez in 1591. This is also from the AG collection. And let's just look at the, the uh, floor here. And you just have to be patient because I have to play with it. You are being very patient. All right, this is our part of the world. And uh, my goodness, roll tide. There's Tuscaloosa sitting right in the middle of this 1591 map. We have a, a, a beautiful map that was done uh, by Father Marquette, who came with the French settlers. And he was a very gifted cartographer as well. And he detailed map the St. Lawrence area and all of the Mississippi Valley. And he got down, and the only thing that he saw fit including in the entire southeastern United States was Tuscaloosa. And I have given replicas of that map to several of my Alabama friends. <laughs> uh, the other maps, and it's, it's a strange combination of what is on this sheet. You have Peru, and you have something else that I'm not sure what it is. I won't speculate, because someone may actually know. This is the new map of America by William Blau. The, the Blau family is in uh, Amsterdam. They make baths for decades, one child after another. But we have a uh, an unbelievable copy of the first atlas of the world that was done by the Blau family in 1621. It's 11 volumes, colored, <clears throat> looks like it was produced yesterday. Uh, they did absolutely wonderful work. Now I want to show you this one because it shows not necessarily the truth, but they show you what Europe saw. And this one includes pictures of all the Native Americans that they had seen, or representatives. And you see they go from unclad uh, jungle dwellers to royal royalty. Looks almost Chinese. Then at the top they have uh, engravings of several cities. So they have Havana and they have San Domingo and they have Cartagena and so on and so on. And that too has a lot of detail on it. But we won't go into all that. This is from the Woodward collection and this is uh, a map of the Mississippi region and uh, Mississippi then, like Mississippi when I was in grade school and having to spell it, gets spelled more than one way, but at this particular time it had just one P in it. Uh, but it also has a, a picture of uh, Jesuit priest, uh, probably a French soldier, Niagara Falls, a little detail, uh, a big buffalo. But I want to show you this. It shows us the route of Ferdinand de Soto, who is another Spanish explorer who came through our part of the world in 1540. We know uh, somewhere back in the 50s or 60s, the federal government sponsored uh, or appointed a 
Federal Commission to actually try to locate the, the route of DeSoto through the southeast. Uh, and everyone agrees that he came somewhere through the uh, Little River Valley area. Uh, there are a lot of caves and all in, that, in the hills up there of the Little River Canyon. And it's generally supported that he came that way. Uh, DeSoto traveled on down. You see the word Alabama is appearing there. Uh, and he would travel on and eventually he would, I forgot if he was killed or died or whatever, but he was buried in the Mississippi River. His soldiers uh, weighted his body down and uh, made sure that it could not be reclaimed and desecrated because he had done his share of desecration and they thought that someone might be anxious to return the favor to uh, Mr. DeSoto. Uh, you see Fort Lewis, which is Mobile. So other areas, Pensacola that you're really familiar with. In August in This is the New Mexico and Florida by Nicholas Sanson, done in 1679. And you see a, a thing that's familiar on many maps from this period, California as an island. California had basically, basically been explored up from the south and into the Gulf of California. And not having found the end of the Gulf of California, they just assumed it went all the way through and that California was an island. Uh, a lot of people think that one day, thanks to some earthquake, it will be such a position again. But uh, you see there's a Cabo San Lucas. Some of you have been there maybe on vacation. Uh, but you notice the tremendous territory that Spain has. But we tend to think today that Spain, uh, we, we, we downplay the Spanish influence on the United States. But they were huge, uh, and you know, their influence was huge. And a little bit later we'll see one that divides what is down north of Africa, what is now the United States, the area of the United States, up into nationalities that, that owned it as such. This is on the wall. This is uh, North America by Nicholas Sanson in 1696. And again, you get a good picture of how big the Spanish area was. You have the English hanging on to the shoreline. You have all of this has been given over to France. And you have everything else is Spanish. They had had inland explorers. They had named areas. They had put their, their landmarks down. They planned to stay. This is a map of the West Indies, and this was done by Herman Mole, who is English. It was done in 1715, and it has a few things on it that I want to show you. Uh, one is this great portrayal of Mexico City. Now this is in 1750. Mexico City had been built uh, after Cortez had destroyed the original city that was on that site. So after leaving it in dust and ashes, he built the new Mexico City on top of it. And by this time you can see it is uh, quite a handsome city with walls protecting it, a uh, lake in the background, all of which is accurate. Also I want to show you, I'll show you this on more than one map, the sailing routes and also the prevailing winds. And just looking at a map you wonder why in the world did they go from here to there? 
to get to Havana. Well, this is the reason they went from here to there to get to Havana. They're, they're, don't want, they, can't, they don't want to sail against the wind. The wind is primarily here, and there are maps in which the major detail on the map is how the wind blows. And those are navigational maps. But you see, they, they show them the route that they picked up treasure in Panama or one of the areas down there, and they took it to Havana, which was the uh, Spain's main uh, loading station, disembarking station, and so on. The ships that came from South and Central America to Havana were, in comparison, small ships. In Havana, they were located, they were uh, loaded onto real men of war, I mean, armor, armadas, uh, big things. Uh, Spain lost very few ships by their being captured at sea. They lost several to storms, but these are heavily armed, well-manned, big ships. And you can see the, after they leave Havana, they go up through the Gulf of Florida, and they go headed for Spain through this Gulf. And they tell you all those sorts of things, like how you can determine how far you are from the coast or how deep the water is. And you see names that you recognize now, Campeche, uh, Cancun, so on. This is a rather neat cartouche. This is a dedication. Uh, probably the guy that paid for the engraving, the printing, uh, Will Patterson, William Patterson, somebody, uh, done by Herman Mobile, and some half of the West Indies, and it's showing the, the properties that belong to Spain, England, France, Holland, and also they're showing the freight winds and this, that, and the other. And they're always according to the newest and most exact observations. Why else would you put a map out that would not have the accurate expect uh, information? Another nice picture, or oh, that might that's the same picture, the same picture. This is an accurate map of the West Indies, uh, done by uh, Emmanuel Bowen, 1740. And this is somewhat a repeat of that map, except it has more detail uh, about the routes, about the winds. And over here, right exactly, they actually tell you in English, this is an English map, how the Spanish galleons are located, are loaded, where they leave from, where they're going to. They go together through the Gulf of Florida for old Spain. Cuba is well documented very early for obvious reasons. Like I say, it's a main coastal station. This is uh, by Holman in 1759, and it's a beautiful map, but the reason I wanted to show it to you is that it gives us a picture of what gold mining was actually like. Uh, Spain took unknown and unknowable treasures from the New World. They actually took more monetary value in silver than they did in gold, uh, but they took an awful lot of it. They became quickly the richest nation in Europe. This is a country that a few years ago was still fighting with itself. And suddenly they, they're the big boys on the block. They paid off all of their national debt. They started rebuilding their navy. They started a very expensive foreign policy. Uh, 
money was so abundant that they spread it around freely at home, and pretty soon nobody wanted to work because there was plenty of money and you could buy the stuff made somewhere else cheaper. So, within less than a generation, Spain goes from one of the most talented countries in Europe to being a country where nobody knew how to do anything. It's something that maybe we should study a little bit. Uh, they didn't make their own shoes anymore because they could buy them somewhere else. They didn't make any of their own clothes anymore because they could buy them somewhere else. And then the money ran out. Within a generation, Spain was bankrupt. They were not only bankrupt, they didn't know how to do anything. So Spain would be a very poor and backward nation for many decades to come. Uh, the Spanish monarchy was desperate to get more gold. Uh, Ferdinand wrote in 1511, quote, get gold. Humanely, if you can, but at all hazards, get gold. That's exactly what they did. At all hazards. It was usually at their hazard, but it was at some hazard. Let's, 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 yes, sir. This map seems to be the first one to correct the longitude problem uh, as far as the spread out. Why we got latitude correct early on, but longitude was a problem. Is that about when the Jim, you're you're exactly right. Uh, and I used to teach a course on geography at UAB once a while. And explaining longitude is, uh, you know, uh, let's deal with brain surgery. It's easier. Uh, it's very complicated, and it took a long time to figure out where these north-south lines went, or how to, how to know where you were from them. Uh, Jim is right, they had the latitude because they could calculate that right from the sun. And Columbus was so good a navigator that if you, try, if you see his route, once he makes the swing around from Spain, if he in fact had stayed on his planned route, and the new world had not been in his way, he would in fact have reached exactly where he thought he was going to go. So it's amazing how accurately they could navigate using nothing but the stars and the sun and a very few uh, simple instruments. They did not even have a compass yet at the beginning of these explorations. But if you remember back from the uh, the oval map of the world, that's the first one over here. There are already uh, horizontal, horizontal and vertical lines on there, although the concept for how to do that had, would not come for a long, long time. But the cartographer did it simply as a way of showing that there were sections of the earth. That is, in fact, what we have today. So there's, the again, the directions to how to get home. This is a map, <coughs> map of uh, Mexico and the United States by De Lille done in 1783. This one and the next one are sort of the end of the story here, but as far as the United States in relationship are concerned. So the United States has been established by now. This is 1783. <coughs> Most of the original, many of the original states, like Virginia, uh, their land grants said actually that they extended from the Atlantic coast to the other coast. But in reality, ending at the Mississippi River, they didn't own the property. Spain collected. Spain is going to get into this financial bind and they're going to sell a good piece of it to France. 
and the French are going to get in a financial bind and they're going to sell it to the United States. So this is uh, Spanish North America done by John Thompson in 1814. You see the, the Louisiana purchase has taken place in the most spectacular real estate deal in history. So it may be buying Alaska. The United States has acquired more property than they had any idea of what was there. So President Jefferson would uh, commit Lewis and Clark to actually going out and finding what was there. But you see, Spain still holds tremendous properties here. This is 1814. Within 30 years, a great portion of this property would be, depending on which historian you're reading, was either taken, bought, or stolen from Spain. Uh, the United States acquired it as a part of the settlement in the Mexican area, which virtually all Americans, American historians designate as the most unjustifiable war the United States has ever been involved in. But it acquired a lot of property that the southern states would be useful for the expansion of slavery. And that created a whole other problem in the United States, which is not the subject of tonight. Spain leaves an unbelievable uh, history here. Half of the New World speaks the Spanish language. A growing portion of North America speaks the Spanish language. Uh, I guess if any child is going through school now, they don't take Spanish, they're missing out on the future, I guess. And Spain leaves other things. Spain leaves a very nasty reputation for how they dealt with Native Americans. And that's largely justified. But, you know, the people that win the war are the ones that get to write the history. Britain's record in New England is no better. It's on a smaller land scale, but they wiped out about the same percentage of Native Americans. The record of the United States is not any better. We've done the same thing with Native Americans in our area. Of all the European powers, the French were the only ones that came with the intent to live with the indigenous peoples. Uh, they are the only people that set out to live around rather than to replace. And their philosophy is reflected in Canada's treatment of Native Americans. Uh, Canada worked around the Native people. They absorbed them or they left them alone uh, as opposed to what the United States did. But Spain was going with, with largely a purpose, uh, and that was a very clear purpose, clearly stated purpose, and that was to bring back wealth. And it, that involved taking a lot, of, a, a lot of human life in the process. Now we said we were gonna finish about 10 till, so we came real close. If you have a question, I probably cannot answer it. Uh, but otherwise, we have a, about 10 or so of these lovely maps on the wall, and you're invited to look at them. And I'll tell you that there are three sets of numbers and letters at the bottom. The first set begins with a G, and it's a classification number, which just puts together subjects together that are the same subject. The last one is a uh, symbol that starts with a period and a letter and then a number. And that just simply puts the author and the cartographer in alphabetical order. But the one in the middle, what you're looking for, that's the date. 
And again, these are the real things. None of these are copies. Uh, yes, Michael. Just from a loss prevention standpoint, I have no idea what these may be valued at. Do you have any idea about the insurance cost or even the market no, value? No, no, I don't. The collection? Uh, we will, I, I will occasionally catalog a map and no library owns it. And the only place I can find it is going to places like Sotheby's or somewhere and find one that has sold, if not currently, at some other time. And we may find a map that is just eye-dropping in value. And you may find that you may have a map that you think is going to be very valuable. And it isn't. So that's supply and demand. But the collection as a whole, I would say, cannot be bad. That's a vague answer, but I think that's about it. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it.